Hello to everyone. Uh, it's very nice to, to see you all and to have you all also through, through Zoom. Um, today we're very happy uh, because we're going to hear from Javier Magan, who is going to tell us about a new measure of quantum state complexity and quantum chaos. So Javier, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me start by, by thanking you all for the, for the invitation to, to contribute to your seminar series. So it is my, my pleasure uh, to share this work uh, and also to share it with, with all friends and, and colleagues. So um, today I want to describe uh, some work that I have done in collaboration with DJ uh, Balasurramanian, Pavel Caputa, and uh, Kinke Yu, uh, whose name is uh, Austin here, and um, who is a PhD student of DJ. And uh, well, it will, it, this work will appear uh, tomorrow. We just send it to. Uh, it is not there, but you can find it tomorrow. The work deals with a, with a new measure of quantum state complexity and its relation to, to quantum chaos and black hole physics, uh, in, like in few words. So I have chosen this figure here, um, mostly so that you won't understand exactly what it is, uh, as the main representative of the article. It is the, the time evolution of the wave function of a uh, universe we all know very well at the classical level, uh, namely the, the eternal black hole. And I hope by the end of the talk, we all understand uh, how, how this is computed and how it is related to state complexity and uh, quantum chaos. So um, let me start with the, with the motivations uh, for this work. So, and in particular, let me start with the, with the ones uh, coming from quantum complexity. So in this context, uh, there is always, a, a, let me say, a huge problem uh, already at the beginning uh, uh, regarding the definition of complexity. Some of the, of the most famous uh, definitions, such as uh, Kolmogorov's, uh, Rishanen, and, uh, and Nielsen, uh, they are all based on the fundamental idea that uh, that the complexity of an object should be understood um, as the number of simple components uh, required to assemble it. As such, uh, there is an obvious uh, ambiguity already from the, from the start, and, uh, and is that the fact that the measure of complexity depends uh, very strongly on the basis of simple components. This ambiguity, let me say, is a bit like, a, like, a, like the original scene. So it is there from the beginning and accompanied accompanies us uh, through all our journey. And uh, actually in the context of holography, it has appeared explicitly in several works uh, that deal with Nielsen complexity and, and the so-called uh, penalties. Uh, and it had, but it has also appeared implicitly in the context of Nielsen complexity in quantum field theory. And uh, of course, when, when trying to, to understand these, these issues uh, and more than that, uh, trying, because we are not like, this is not our main motivation, but we are trying to apply it to, to, uh, to black hole physics and to physics in general, uh, we would like, uh, of course, to get rid of these ambiguities. And uh, in this work, uh, we are going to propose a, a potential way out. So um, a, different set <clears throat> a different set of motivations comes from the field of quantum chaos. So uh, there is, a, let me say, an obvious, almost obvious expected uh, deep relation between chaos and complexity, and this uh, needs no motivation. So in common language, we often do not even distinguish between uh, chaotic and complex dynamics. So let me say more concretely, uh, we, expect, we expect chaotic uh, systems to be more complex or to be able at least to produce more complexity than, than simple systems. Um, yet quantum complexity and uh, quantum chaos are, are by now uh, two, uh, let me say, pretty sophisticated and evolved uh, fields with very mild bridges between them. So basically in the common language, we use them sometimes uh, without distinction, but uh, like uh, in the real science, they are, they are two uh, like uh, well-constructed buildings that do not talk to each other. So uh, for, uh, like the, the main example here would be the, the famous conjecture in quantum chaos, uh, which states the, the universality of spectral statistics in chaotic theories. This is sometimes called the, the Boigas uh, Yanoni Smith uh, conjecture. And um, as is well known by now, maybe in, the, in our community, aspects of this conjecture are also encoded in, the, in what is known as the spectral form factor, which we are going to define uh, later. 
and this has indeed been studied uh, recently in the context of, of black holes. Uh, again, yet uh, there is no relation between this famous uh, quantum chaology, let me say, and uh, quantum complexity. Another fundamental corner uh, of quantum chaos is uh, that of Lyapun Lyapunov exponents. Uh, and in this direction, there have been several recent movements uh, building the connections to quantum complexity, namely through uh, operator size, Nielsen complexity, uh, Kirillov complexity, uh, and some uh, recent relations between chaos uh, and geometry. Um, but well, uh, still, uh, it, is, it is all very recent and, and needs, uh, needs some sort of uh, we need to, 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 to move forward still. And finally, from a, from a non-dynamical perspective, we are also, I mean, one is also motivated to understand uh, the complexity of finite states in a precise manner, and probably uh, connect, uh, connect that with recent work uh, on Nielsen complexity by, by DJ uh, Argun and, and collaborators. So of course, all this is a, is a vast and challenging territory. And today uh, we are just going to fill uh, the first part Namely, uh, we are going to describe a precise relation between the, the Boigas uh, Janoni Smith con quantum chaos conjecture, uh, the spectral form factor, and quantum complexity. Uh, the last set of motivations comes from quantum gravity. So, in particular, here uh, we, we are typically interested in the conjecture long time complexity dynamics for chaotic systems uh, uh, that was uh, described by, by, by Saskine. And uh, also, it, we are also interested uh, in the in these holographic complexity proposals. Relatedly, um, one would like to to deepen on the um, on the relations between complexity and general relativity, whether in the form of path integral complexity or Nielsen complexity geometry. And uh, in this direction, uh, today we are going to concentrate on the long time dynamics of complexity, and indeed uh, we are going to refine such kind conjecture on such behavior, which we also will describe later. Um, but uh, let me say that uh, although we are not going to talk about maybe our measure will turn out to be uh, related uh, in, a, in a precise uh, manner. Let me see one more, sorry, with the internet. Okay. So let me say that uh, our, our measure will turn out to be related uh, uh, in a precise manner to uh, several geometric uh, quantities. And we hope that we, this will pave the way to understand the other points uh, in, this, uh, in this slide as well. So, um, okay. So having laid out the, the, the motivations, let me go to the plan of the talk. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we are going to start with the definition. Uh, then we will explain two computational methods, which are convenient in different um, in different uh, complementary situations. Uh, to have some intuition, we will start by describing some models that uh, that can be treated analytically, and uh, after that, uh, uh, we will finally move to the core of the talk and describe several examples that are uh, related in one way or the other to uh, the physics of black holes. Uh, and uh, in particular, we are going to describe the, the Schwarzschild theory, random matrices, and, and SYK. Uh, we, will, we will end up with some uh, short summary and, and discussion. So uh, let's move to the, to the definition. So suppose we start with, uh, with uh, initial state and allow it to spread to, uh, to time evolution. So the question is, how can we... Um, to start with, uh, we would like to characterize this notion of a spread more precisely. So what, what do we mean with a spread? So let's, let's be a little bit more precise. So let's assume now that we have a, a, a given but arbitrary uh, order basis P. Uh, so yeah, uh, and uh, having that uh, order basis, we can define more precisely the notion of a spread by a formula uh, like this one here. Um, so in this formula, the coefficients cn uh, are uh, open. We will we will take uh, usually uh, cn equal to n but for the moment and for the theorems that, that we are going to show. Um, it, it doesn't not, it does not matter. So these coefficients cn are just uh, uh, strictly growing uh, as a function of n. So the intuition here is that as the as the, as the wave function spreads through the basis, this quantity grows uh, grows accordingly. 
and of course uh, in principle in which if we choose n uh, this is this is uh, upper bounded by the dimension of the field group so um before going on let me say that that an alternative uh, an alternative definition of what what could we mean by a spread would be to use the, the exponential of the entropy of the probability distribution in the given order of basis. Now, the question now is, of course, what basis uh, uh, should we use? No, here it seems that uh, that we are again faced uh, with this uh, with these ambiguities that plague the discussion uh, in quantum in quantum complexity. And uh, what we are going to propose uh, is that in in Kolmogorov's uh, spirit. Complexity should be defined as the minimum overall uh, possible overall choices of, of basis in the Hilbert space. So now, uh, as we all know, uh, this this sort of definitions based on optimizations over a space of uh, possibilities have appeared many times in physics and mathematics uh, in, uh, for several reasons. Um, but it is typically the, the case that they, they, they are of a small practical use because uh, they cannot be solved in explicit examples. So this is not going to be the case here. Uh, here we can solve such minimization uh, precisely, and it works as follows. So uh, notice that given, given uh, initial states, this size zero here, um, there is a canonical basis and, and a unit, sorry, given this size zero and a unitary evolution, uh, acting on it, there is a canonical basis that we can construct. Um, basically, we start with size zero and also with all the states that uh, arise by uh, repeated actions of the Hamiltonian, this uh, psi n. And um, we can now use, uh, th these ones are not orthogonal in general, but we can now use the Grand Smith orthogonalization to produce uh, an orthogonal basis out, out of those. You know? In the in the literature, uh, well, so yeah, this gives this gives by by construction this gives a, an orthonormal basis for the part of the Hilbert space that is explored by the time evolution, and this basis in the in the in recent literature is sometimes called the the key of basis. Now let me define uh, the following string of derivatives uh, of the spread at t equal to zero. So basically, it's the Taylor the, the coefficients of the Taylor expansion uh, at to infinity. So in this article, in, in our article, we prove the, the following the following the, um, the following results. The first is that uh, uh, is a theorem for any basis b. This string uh, of, uh, of of time derivatives at t equal to zero is min is minorized by the Kirillov basis uh, with equality only for the what we call the complete Kirillov basis, which is just uh, well. Um, so this when when we do this when we do this uh, Grand Smith uh, orthogonalization, um, it could be the case that we produce, I mean, we are going to produce an orthogonal basis, but uh, it might not be a full basis for the Hilbert space. This is not going to be the case for us since our systems are chaotic, but, uh, but well, uh, just for, for completeness, uh, it could, the, the time evolution could just um, explore a finite part of the, of the a subspace sub of the Hilbert space. And um, well, and therefore we need to complete th that basis in some way. So any basis that completes uh, the Kirillov basis uh, in any way, uh, we call it a complete Kirillov basis, and um, and this theorem says that uh, this uh, complete Kirillov basis min uh, minimizes this uh, string uh, string of derivatives. Now, uh, this theorem has a corollary, which says that uh, the spread now without derivatives uh, defined by the increasing sequence and the basis B is minimized uh, near t equal to zero by a complete Kirillov basis. So the quantum state complexity, as we have defined it, is then uh, the spread in the kilo basis. Let me say that uh, you could complain that, uh, uh, well, how can we trust that the minimization is going to work? I mean, until what time? And this is something that is a, an open question here, just to give you some more confidence that uh, that um, that this is the right definition. Uh, we can actually prove a, a, a third result, which says that. Um, uh, for discrete time evolution, the spread is minimized in the kilo basis for all times. So actually, in the in practical scenarios, uh, is is really going to be uh, a minimum. So um, 
uh, there, there are some questions here. Maybe people that are not used to, to the kilo basis. Okay, so to, so we conclude that to compute the previous notion of complexity, we must derive uh, the kilo basis. Uh, by this, we mean, uh, let me repeat it, uh, we start with the vectors that appear uh, by repeated action of the Hamiltonian in the initial state. And then we perform the Grand Smith uh, orthogonalization on those and derive an orthonormal uh, basis uh, for the subspace of the Hilbert space explored by the evolution. Now, uh, luckily, uh, this, uh, this problem is well known in the literature. And the solution is also well known and comes under the name of uh, the Langsos algorithm, which uh, you have here this uh, nice book uh, on the subject. Uh, uh, that is already quite quite old. So the Lanzos algorithm, let me let me so it's, it's basically completely summarized in this uh, set of equations here, these three equations here. Uh, but uh, it's expressed by 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 the first two simple equations, which instruct us how to get the let's say the n plus one uh, kilo basis vector out of the two previous ones. So in these equations, the co uh, there are some coefficients that are going to play a, a leading role. Uh, which are known as the as the Langsos coefficients, and uh, we, I mean, uh, well, and this, of course, this iterative process has to be uh, corrected by some initial condition, and um, the initial conditions are basically that uh, well, these are technical things that I'm not going to enter, but are, that v zero equal to zero, and that the initial state is part is the is the first state in the in the kilo basis. So. What is important for us now is that it is simple to see that from this equation, from the defining equation, which is this first one here, the Hamiltonian in the kilo basis acts in this uh, simple way here. So um, it is a tradiagonal matrix. Notice that uh, maybe some of you already have seen this, but um, it is kind of uh, interesting that all, all Hamiltonians, no matter where they come from, uh, when they apply, when they are applied uh, to certain initial state, they can be put in this form, even random Hamiltonians. So, uh, for finite dimensional matrices, uh, this form of the Hamiltonian is known as the Hessenberg form of the Hamiltonian, and there are uh, numerically stable algorithms to to compute this Hessenberg form. Actually, even Mathematica has such a subroutine. So. Uh, so for finite uh, systems uh, with discrete uh, spectra, such as the uh, that we are going to study, such as the SYK or, or matrix models, we can use uh, directly these subroutines uh, to compute. Uh, so basically, we just give the Hamiltonian, we just give the initial state, and just ask him uh, for the for this Hessenberg form, uh, which is a tridiagonal matrix, and um, and from this, uh, we just read the, the Langsos coefficients. This is a little bit more explained, uh, better explained in the article that uh, I don't want to enter in, 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 in many technical details. But uh, this is just, uh, I just want to say that this is the first method. Is the, the, let's, let me say, is the, the best method uh, at a computational level because, uh, well, um, we, are going to see, we are going to see the results are going to, to speak by, by themselves. But, um, but this computational method does not work for infinite dimensional systems or systems with continuous spectrum. You, know, you need, uh, you really need this, this method really needs uh, to input a Hamiltonian, which is a n by n matrix. So uh, a more general uh, method is the, is the following. So we first define what is known as the, as the survival amplitude. Uh, this is just uh, the amplitude for the state to remain unchanged as time evolves. So it's defined by this equation here. Um, we are going to assume that uh, we can compute such quantity by other means. And this is going to be the case in the, in the examples. Uh, so just stay with me. So uh, um, basically this is, this is the input uh, that we are going to use, this survival amplitude. From the, from the survival amplitude, if we, if we can compute it, we can compute then the, the time derivatives at time equal to zero, and these are called the moments, basically because uh, just by, by taking the derivatives, we see that these are the, the moments of the Hamiltonian uh, in the initial state. Um, now, let me, let, me remind, let me remind the particular form of the, of the action uh, of the Hamiltonian in the kilo basis, and uh, which was given by, by, by this equation here. 
Um, but uh, let me put it in a more maybe uh, visual way, which is uh, this plot here in which um, uh, we have uh, put that equation into the form of a Markov chain. So in this, um, in this Markov chain, the nodes are the Kirillov basis vectors, so K0, K1, K2, and the arrows uh, connecting them uh, correspond to the possible hoppings along the chain. So uh, the Bs uh, move us uh, back and forth uh, to nearest neighbors, and the and the A's uh, are just like a kind of like a mass. Uh, they they just uh, uh, stay in the same place. So uh, more con let me say more concretely, uh, in this Markov chain, the weights are the Langsos coefficients, and the Hamiltonian is the transition matrix. And uh, we can we, we can use this uh, perspective to compute the moments uh, from knowledge of the Langsos coefficients, or vice versa, or to uh, namely to compute the Langsos coefficients from knowledge of the moments. And let's let's say uh, I don't want to enter. I know this is a little bit maybe uh, kind of technical. I just want to give some some small details, but uh, without entering in the in yeah to a specific description. But uh, let me explain how that works a, a bit. So uh, to explain it, it is better to like go uh, a little bit further in this uh, in these drawings and do what is known as the, to unwrap the Markov chain. So uh, this uh, this produces this kind of uh, of uh, of uh, triangle of triangles. So the, what is important, uh, it contains well, it contains a lot of information of the Markov chain. Let me just describe a part of it. So. What is important here is that the base nodes, uh, the zero, one, two, three, now you should think them as the moments of the Hamiltonian and the arrows uh, connecting, uh, connecting different nodes uh, are the Langsos coefficients. So basically to compute moments from Langsos, we just sum, uh, so, uh, so for example, to compute the, the fair moment, we just sum over all possible paths from the from the zero node to the third node um, uh, without without loops. So, for example, let me put uh, um, let me put an example. The first moment is just i a zero because it's the only path. The second moment is uh, well, and sorry, and uh, we sum over all possible paths, and each path and each path is weighted by the product of weights around the path. So basically, in this case, yeah. Let's let's uh, put examples. So the, the first moment we uh, the first moment is equal to i zero, and the second moment is equal to i zero square plus i b one square. Okay, so it is clear that uh, knowledge. I mean, with this kind of rule, knowledge of uh, of the Langsos coefficients allow the computation of the moment. But this is not what we what we were wanting. Um, we wanted to start from the survival amplitude that give us the moments. And now we want to obtain the Langsos coefficients. But for this, we just need to reverse the logic and to see and to, uh, to go carefully step by step. And we see that how it works. No? So if we have the first moment, then we can compute i a zero because it's the it's just the first moment is just i a zero. But now we now we have the first moment, the second moment, and i a zero. So uh, then uh, the equation defining the second moment allows to compute b uh, one. And then the next one allows to compute uh, a one, and the next one, and, and so on and so forth. So this is um, kind of uh, involved, but uh, the important point is that uh, is that it can be this can be done. So this this uh, this then provides two methods to compute uh, the Langsos coefficients: uh, one from the Heisenberg form and one from the survival amplitude. So once once uh, once we have these these coefficients, we can proceed as follows. So we expand the time evolving state in the kilo basis, and uh, well, it is it is a trivial computation to to see that on this basis the Schrodinger equation takes this explicit this explicit form here. It, this is basically the same equation that uh, I described before, uh, which is the action of the Hamiltonian in the kilo basis, and um, so with this. So we started with the survival amplitude. We obtained the, the, the Langsos coefficient. So we uh, arrived to this equation here. And now obtaining all other amplitudes is just an algebraic procedure. Um, because, uh, well, um, 
yeah, uh, maybe, maybe it's not transparent to see it here, but if you have size zero, then you can compute uh, algebraically uh, without, I mean, with algebraically, I mean, without uh, solving any differential equation. It's just, uh, just taking derivatives, you compute psi one and then psi two and so on and so forth. Um, so this algorithmic process is better explained in the article, but, uh, but let me say that it, it is, uh, yeah, it is uh, quite straightforward. So um, once we do this, uh, we just com when we, we have computed all the wave function for all the necessary um, uh, kilo basis vectors, we can compute the complexity by using this formula or using the, the entropic definition. Okay, so uh, let me let me let me repeat. Uh, this is this is admittedly a somewhat uh, involved computational process that, uh, for the people in string theory of quantum gravity, is kind of very weird and uh, opaque. But um, before moving on to a specific examples uh, and to motivate and convince you and convince uh, uh, yeah convince you all that this is a worldwide direction. Um, it is illuminating to apply this framework to the thermophile level state in general, which is what we are going to do all the time, but let's do it in general here. So the thermophile level state is defined as usual. We make the, the tensor product, we make the tensor product of the original Hilbert space with uh, itself. And uh, we call, well, typically we call one of the theories uh, the left and the other the right. And uh, once we construct this, uh, this tensor product, we construct this state out of the eigenstate of the, of the original Hamiltonian uh, with, this, uh, with, this, uh, with these amplitudes here. Um, as is well known, this state purifies uh, the thermal ensemble for each of the left-right theories. Now, this state is invariant. I mean, it's, cru uh, it's crucial that it is invariant under the evolution of uh, and the unitary evolution with uh, drive, uh, driven by the Hamiltonian h left minus h right. Okay, but uh, it is also very important for the in the context of black holes that it is not invariant under the evolution of only one Hamiltonian. You know? So, if we evolve uh, with the let's say with the left Hamiltonian uh, as we define here, basically we started at time equal to zero with the thermophile double, and that uh, evolving with that Hamiltonian, you can check. That it is like kind of uh, analytically continue the, temp the temperature beta by two times IT. Okay. And this, uh, the point is that it's going to disrupt uh, all the phases. I mean, all the different amplitudes is going to disrupt them uh, when the energies are, are chaotic. Um, so in ADSCFT, we all know that thermophile doubles are dual to eternal black holes. And this evolution, uh, although it is not understood how, and this uh, I hope that this uh, sparkles uh, the discussion, but it is, it is really expected, I think uh, everybody agrees, it is expected to describe aspects of the black hole interior in whatever form. So uh, what is important for us is that uh, uh, the survival amplitude, so we have defined, we, we have taken an initial state and we have evolved with certain Hamiltonian, and this was exactly the input uh, that we needed to compute the, to, to find the complexity. And uh, what we saw before is that uh, to actually compute it, the, the, real, uh, the real starting point is the survival amplitude. And the survival amplitude here is just the analytically continued partition function. So in other words, let me repeat it. Uh, so the, if I square it, uh, this uh, survival amplitude, I, guess I, I get what is known as the survival probability. And uh, but it, this is equal to the spectral form factor of the theory. So um, maybe for the people that uh, are are not uh, um, aware of of, of this uh, uh, of this progress, uh, let me say that the, the spectral form factor, which is exactly defined as so I define it now, is this is the in this equation of the survival amplitude is the modulus square of uh, of it, or of, it is typically defined as the modulus square of the right hand side. But here, in, like what we are what we are seeing is that uh, this modulus square of the right hand side is the survival probability of some dyna dynamical process that we are going to study in more detail. Um, so uh, yeah, so here, so in this in in the context of the kilo basis, the spectral form factor is just the first entry uh, of the uh, probability distribution in the kilo in the kilo basis. 
So, um, yeah, so, well, um, let me may maybe make a kind of a, um, exaggerated uh, but motivating uh, comment that uh, we expect that this very simple observation uh, might, uh, I mean, we, we see it as a very promising avenue, and we are going to, to, to justify that, uh, as a very promising avenue to build the bridge between quantum complexity, quantum chaos, and quantum gravity. So it touches all the, all the corners in a very, in a very um, uh, sensible point. And also, let me say that uh, it, it might provide, or we, we expect it to provide an avenue to turn the characterization of phases uh, in terms of partition functions in, um, to a novel characterization of phases in terms of the dynamics of quantum complexity, which might help uh, to understand new features. So, okay, so before, so other, other, well, I'm going to stop one, there one moment to see if there are, uh, if, uh, there are some questions. Okay, so I, I continue. So before going to the interesting but uh, complicated models, uh, it is good to gather some, some intuition from analytical examples. And um, to such end, uh, we borrow recent techniques uh, that uh, we developed in this recent article with uh, Pavel and, and Patranis. Uh, this technique assumes, uh, starts with a very strong assumption uh, that the Hamiltonian belongs to the Lie algebra of a certain group. Um, and has the following form here. So it is uh, the sum of certain uh, uh, ladder, I mean, certain uh, ladder operators on the raising, so the raising operator and the lowering operator. And we can also add uh, um, an element belonging to the, to the Cartan algebra, to the Cartan subalgebra. Now, the observation that we did in the paper with, with Pavel and, and Patramis is that uh, the action of, uh, of this type of Hamiltonian in the, in the, in the representation basis uh, is the same as the action of the Hamiltonian in the kilo basis that we described uh, before. So uh, maybe not so transparent at first sight, but we can conclude that uh, starting in a highest weight, in a, in, a, in a certain representation, in a certain highest weight, um, we can uh, identify the kilo basis with the representation ba basis of the highest weight. So, um, um, Basically, uh, yeah, we can we can identify uh, yeah each Kirillov basis vector with its uh, representation uh, basis vector in the in the in the representation of in the unitary representation of the group considered, and then just by by the known action because we just go to the books and we know how the raising and lowering operators uh, act on that representation basis. Uh, this gives us directly the the Langsos coefficients. Okay. Uh, another insightful observation that we did in this paper uh, and that we use here is that uh, in this scenario, in these scenarios, the time evolution of, uh, of the state becomes an instance of a generalized displacement operator. So basically, the evolution is a is a uh, time dependent coherent state. Okay, uh, and this allows uh, very easily by using group theory techniques uh, the computation of the wave function on the kilo basis. So in this article. Uh, we apply this logic to SL2R, to SU2, and to the Heisenberg wild, wild group. Here I'm going only to describe uh, very briefly the case of uh, SL2R, uh, which is probably the more interest, the most interesting. Uh, in this case, uh, with, so let me repeat the form of the Hamiltonian. So uh, the form of the Hamiltonian is, is this first equation here. But now, uh, now we know we are, what, what we are talking about, this, this uh, Raising and, and lowering operators are just, and the and the L zero uh, they just close uh, the SL two R algebra. Now uh, we can go to the books and in a representation in a discrete series representations with uh, with a scaling dimension H, uh, the generators uh, act uh, as uh, as is written here. And this allows to read the and these are and then these are the the Lanzos coefficients directly as we mentioned uh, before. So we now. We now do the, the, the identification, the identification uh, between the states in the representation basis, level by n, and the kilo basis states. And then this allows us to uh, read off the, these ANs and BNs coefficients. Um, so 
In particular, notice, uh, I want to, and this is a technical uh, comment for the people that have worked in the, in the in, in kill of uh, operator complexity. So in part, uh, notice that the AN uh, here grow linearly with N, uh, while the BN, uh, although it starts with a square root behavior, it also grows linearly with N at large, uh, at sufficiently large N. And, um, but this, uh, so, so basically, um, well, let me let me just say we, we can by using the, the techniques. I'm not I'm not going to the through the details, which are kind of uh, involved cal calculations. But uh, uh, we can compute the quantum complexity using group theory uh, methods, and one obtains this formula here, uh, which uh, well, it's a little bit may seem a little bit complicated, but it's just a very very simple uh, universal behavior. So uh, basically, uh, we get exponential growth. For uh, for this gamma smaller than two alpha, which is what we would expect, uh, because the a n and the I mean because the b n's grow linearly with n. Okay, what we would expect from the from knowledge in 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 kill of operator complexity. But uh, what is interesting here is that the that the the a n's might have a, a dramatic um, uh, impact on the dynamics, and actually even if both of them grow linearly with n. Uh, for certain parameters, in this case for gamma uh, greater than two alpha, we get um, we get uh, actually uh, the exponential growth is is broken and we get uh, sinusoidal uh, recurrent evolution. Uh, in the transition, basically, um, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, in the transition uh, it will be important in below. Uh, it's just a quadratic growth uh, without bound. Let me just conclude this this uh, this part by saying that uh, although this might seem um, kind of uh, yeah I don't know uh, uninteresting uh, maybe just for pedagogical reason actually um, for h equal to one half this problem uh, describes the thermophile double evolution of the harmon of, of the harmonic or inverted oscillator and this uh, gamma equal to two alpha is exactly the transition uh, between harmonic or inverted. So at that, at that point, basically, you have a free particle on the line, and the uh, complexity uh, grows quadratically with time. And uh, I was thinking, when preparing this talk, I was thinking, should I tell this to, the, to, the, to them or not? And um, at the end, I decided to put these slides, analytical slides, because actually, uh, what is interesting is that this, uh, this, uh, this transition point in which, um, in which uh, uh, complexity grows quadratically, and you have uh, this uh, this uh, explicit uh, Langsos coefficients. They, it is actually going to appear universally in all the models. So, although this is an analytical example, which is kind of very contrived, I mean, uh, without no motivation, actually it will appear as some kind of universal uh, effective descri description of in all the in all the models that we are going to describe. So, uh, keep with me one moment. Uh, can I ask you something here? Yeah. So if you would consider, let's say, a system with a unique Hamiltonian, like n equals four or whatever, do we expect such parameters to be fixed? So all we were able to see essentially this, uh, the, the transition between exponential and recurrent evolution. Well, uh, here, I mean, uh, remember, I mean, uh, no, uh, it will be fixed. I mean, here you see that okay. uh, the, the parameters uh, gamma and alpha that are, uh, are, are, are exactly the parameters uh, uh, defining the Hamiltonian. So in the Hamiltonian, if you see the first equation in this slide, is alpha times uh, the sum plus gamma times L0. So depending on, on how you fix uh, gamma with alpha, uh, basically you can see gamma as, 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 as a some sort of like a, a potential energy. No, binding the particle to, to be at the center, and the other alpha is like some kind of uh, 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 drift. Uh, uh, well, yeah, this is this is better explained. I didn't want to put more, this is better explained in the in the article, but uh, but yeah, one one tends to keep the particle uh, static, and the other tends to keep the particle uh, moving moving far. In a explicit uh, theory, you have a explicit Hamiltonian, and uh, and uh, you don't have any choice. This is what we are going to see in a moment. And actually, in the, uh, what we are going to see is that uh, the explicit Hamiltonians describing black holes uh, are universally described by uh, the transition point gamma equal to two alpha. So it's explicit; you cannot move it. I didn't. I don't know if I answered your question. 
you can you can answer, you can ask again if yeah, I yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so let's let's go to let's let's start going a little bit uh, towards uh, more interesting theories. So uh, let's start. Um, yeah, and in particular examples describing aspects of, of black holes. So we start with the with the Schwarzian theory. So this is known to so this theory uh, is known to appear in the low energy limit of SYK, and also in the boundary description of JT gravity. It is it is defined by the by this Euclidean uh, action in zero plus one dimensions, where f is the degree of freedom, and the brackets stand for the Schwarzian for the Schwarzian derivative, uh, which is also uh, defined here. I guess well, I guess this needs not too much introduction, but I just wanted to put it. Um, the coefficient c in the front of the action uh, can be thought of as a central charge or or as an inverse inverse coupling, and uh, indeed the the semi classical or uh, or weak coupling limit arises by by taking the the large c limit. Now, uh, what is important? Of, well, there are many things uh, important in this model, and I'm not going to review them since they have been uh, described in recent years. Uh, uh, they, ha they have been at the they have been at the center of the discussion in recent years. But uh, uh, for us, in this case, uh, this model can be solved. Well, this model describes uh, two-dimensional black holes, and this and it can be solved explicitly. In particular, uh, we have uh, the exact partition functions, which is this one here. Okay, so. Um, the, this partition function is well known that uh, uh, when when written in terms of a, of an integral of a density of states, it shows a continuous density of states. So this model has a continuous spectrum, and so we cannot use the the, the first of the methods to 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 proceed with the computation. We cannot do we cannot just uh, plug into Mathematica this Hamiltonian and, uh, and 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 ask him to to provide to us the Heisenberg form. Uh, we need to use the second method, but at least um, so because we have the partition function, we also have the analytically continued partition function, the, which means that uh, that we have the survival amplitude of the thermofield double explicitly. So equivalently, uh, it's the same thing to say that we have all the exact moments, which are just the the thermal expectation values of the of powers of the Hamiltonian, which are, which are this one here. So using the algorithm uh, that I described before, um, one can numerically compute the, the Lanzos coefficients. And interestingly, they look very similar to the SL2R uh, scenario. So basically, the ANs uh, are linear, as uh, in the SL2R, and the DN start with a square root followed by linear behavior. Um, one can one can uh, make the bridge with the SL2R more precise and actually verify that a large chain for I mean a large chain with with large chain now I mean uh, a large uh, um, uh, little n that, that uh, labels the kilo basis vector. Uh, so a large chain for any temperature, uh, these uh, coefficients approach the free regime of the harmonic oscillator. So um, they satisfy this equation here, uh, a n equal to two b n, and then um, and then at large times uh, complexity grows uh, quadratically. But actually, uh, well, one can verify that uh, it, it, it grows quadratically at all times. And this can be mo maybe more nicely seen at uh, in the semi-classical limit, where we expect the, the geometric description in terms of the 2D black hole uh, to be accurate. So in this semi-classical limit, as we uh, let the central charge go, go to infinity, uh, we can verify that the, uh, that the ANs and the BNs actually match the formula of the, of the, of the SL2R for all little n. So, um, so well, this means that uh, the time evolution of the Schwarzschild thermofield double is well described by motion in the SL2R group uh, for a particular uh, scaling dimension. And this implies that, uh, well, that we can define a nice and close uh, com uh, complexity algebra following, following uh, this recent article here, which I'm not describing, but um, it is described also in the article. But it's important here is just that there is it is interesting that you start with. The, I want to maybe remark what I'm saying here. You start with the thermofield level. You evolve with the left Hamiltonian. Uh, in principle, uh, nobody will tell you uh, what is the um, right Hilbert space in which to describe that. In principle, it's actually following the the solutions of the of the Schwarzian. It should be some kind of uh, superposition of many representations of the SL2R group. 
but actually when you do that uh, and you compute the kilo basis uh, the the thermophil level effectively moves in one single representation so this is a normal simplification it's some kind of universal effective regime and this uh, this uh, this observation actually tells us that the complexity grows quadratically uh, uh, for all times and that the rate is controlled by the variance of the in the energy um, um, well there are in the article we provide several arguments for that but uh, it is very it is very robust i mean and of course it it, it is verified by by the numerics um, so let me say what is important here more than the quadratic growth uh, which is not so interesting and actually doesn't match maybe your expectations is that this behavior arises just because the spectrum is uh, is continuous and uh, and and also there is no bound uh, from above in the energy so the thermophile level or the thermal ensemble uh, explore energies uh, until infinity so then the, the evolution of the thermophile level let's say has a you know evolve i mean explores an, an infinite dimension of hilbert space and the uh, complexity just grows um, just um, grows quadratically so therefore this is this is a bit uh, let me say this is a bit unsatisfactory and calls for an analysis of a better model of quantum black holes that uh, that has discrete spectra and finite energy band and uh, we are going to move to to such cases now so if before before describing uh, uh, the explicit results uh, let me motivate a bit these models for the maybe you everything that i'm going to say you all know but uh, uh, let me just let me just say it so um, basically, let me let me motivate why we should uh, study these models and why we should trust their predictions. Um, so we are going to start with uh, with um, with matrix models, and in this case, let me say first that uh, a basic conjecture states that the fine grain structure of the spectrum of a quantum chaotic Hamiltonian is well approximated by the statistics of random matrices. So this is something called uh, the Boigas Janoni Smith conjecture. And uh, but what is important for us is that given the energy time uncertainty principle, uh, we expect that aspects of long time dynamics in chaotic systems will be very, uh, well described by statistics of uh, nearby and not so nearby and uh, eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian in the random matrix approximation. So let me say it in another way. Since we are seeking to understand universal aspects of black holes and, uh, and more general chaotic systems, and in particular, we are seeking to understand the long time dynamics. It is natural to start by considering uh, random Hamiltonians. And we are going to do so, we, I mean, we are going to study all three universality, universality classes, the Gaussian unitary ensemble, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, and the Gaussian symplectic uh, ensemble. So um, let's start with the, with, the, with the first. So the Gaussian unitary ensemble is defined as an ensemble of Hermitian and by n matrices with Gaussian measure. measure. And uh, given this ensemble uh, of finite dimensional Hamiltonians, we now follow uh, these steps here uh, for different values of n. So let me let me let me read them. So we first take, I mean, uh, it is a kind of a, a tedious uh, process, but it is very straightforward. So we first take an instance of a random Hamiltonian. We diagonalize it and construct the thermophile level. We can do it explicitly in the computer. Uh, we then find the uh, the Hamiltonian in the kilo basis, which uh, in this case, this can be done simply by putting uh, by putting it in Hessenberg form. Uh, and there are uh, these stable uh, subroutines uh, to do so. Like now, when, when, we, when we have such a form, we can read off uh, the Langshaw's coefficients, the ANs and the BNs. And then uh, we just exponentiate this form and apply it to the initial state. So we exponentiate this form to construct the unitary evolution. We just multiply uh, to the initial vector, which is the thermophile level, and we can read off the wave function. Uh, from the wave function, we finally compute the, the state complexity. So, so here is the, uh, let's start with the Langshaw's coefficients. So for finite n, uh, these are given uh, by these uh, two figures. Uh, notice that they are, uh, uh, they are uh, expressed as a function of uh, little n divided by the dimension of the Hilbert space, the dimension of the Hamiltonian, I mean, of the matrix representing the Hamiltonian. And um, let me say that the A's uh, plateau very rapidly at zero. This is important because it, uh, it simplifies quite, quite a lot the uh, potential uh, analytic approaches. 
uh, and the bees slowly decay uh, to zero uh, with a rate that is uh, that is subleading that is of order one over n. So it is uh, it uh, dies in the in the in the semi-classical limit. So this means that so what this means is that even if you are seeing that uh, the bns are not constant, they are actually constant over any finite uh, uh, interval of little n in the large uh, in the in the in the semi-classical limit in the large capital n uh, limit so um the point is that of course i mean so they are so you should see them you, you should see the bn really like a plateau but uh, of course uh, the bn need to decay to zero since the system is uh, is finite and the Langsos algorithm uh, must halt when uh, when we have produced a full basis for the Hilbert space let me say that uh, very similar behavior uh, for the bees has been found in the context of uh, kill of complexity recently, in particular, uh, Arjun, uh, Lampros, Mose, and Jamie have done important uh, contributions here. Um, okay, so to analyze the transition, uh, so, so here, okay, so sorry. So here we see two regimes, one very, very sharp regime of linear behavior, and, and then the, the, well, uh, the other regime. Uh, to analyze the transition between one of the other, um, well, this, this transition already from the eye, it seems to be in a, a value of little n that is of order one in the large n limit, in the large capital n limit. So it, in principle, it should be able, we should be able to study to study it in the in the large semi classic in the large matrix size limit, and uh, this is the case, and this is uh, these are the Langsos coefficients uh, at infinite n. And we see that for different temperatures, and we see, I mean, here, the only thing that I want to mention is that the, the transition occurs at uh, at, uh, n, at little n uh, of order one, and therefore it, uh, it will be related to uh, small times in the evolution of complexity. So this differs from the, from the for the people that have studied this, this transition in, in field of operator complexity, this is, this is a difference. Um, okay, so now, now, uh, using the Langsos coefficients, uh, we can, uh, we can, as, as I explained before, we can compute the probabilities and the quantum complexity. And uh, we do this in this uh, figure here. Uh, quite, in quite interestingly, uh, we conclude that the Gaussian unitary ensemble complexity displays of the thermophil level uh, this, uh, for different temperatures. Notice that it doesn't really matter uh, what temperature. Uh, it displays uh, four regimes. So first, uh, we have a ramp. For exponentially long times until uh, a peak of exponential size. Then uh, we have a downward slope um, until a plateau is reached. The plateau time and, and, and its height as well are exponential in the entropy as well. So um, notice that the time here is uh, again um, uh, divided by the dimension of the Hilbert space. So that's why everything is of order one, but you should, you should multiply it by, by the dimension of the Hilbert space. The same with the complexity. The complexity is plotted uh, uh, divided by the dimension of the Hilbert space. Um, so, so in this plot, uh, so let, let me let me say that these are. Sorry, I didn't say this. Uh, so here you see two kind two two families of of uh, of hues of, of 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 lines. One are the dark colors, and one are one is with soft color. So we with the 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 ones with dark colors. Uh, are the ones uh, corresponding to the to the Gaussian unit and ensemble, and the ones uh, with the without I mean with soft colors uh, with light colors, uh, they correspond to just the Wigner semicircle law, uh, so the same density of states, but uh, without universal spectral correlation. So basically, we just take the the Wigner semicircle uh, law and we uh, draw eigenvalues at random, and we just uh, use those to compute the complexity. And we see that in that case, we miss the, the slope. And we are going to explain this in a moment. Uh, before, I mean, why is that? Uh, and why we did that? Uh, before doing that, uh, let me just say that this behavior reminds us of the behavior of the spectrum fault factor in the random, in random matrix theory. So I rem, uh, from, the present, from the present perspective, I, let me remind that the spectrum fault factor is just the first entry. So it uh, was defined before. It's just the first entry of the probability distribution in the kilo basis. So it's this here. Uh, but uh, as we as we are uh, as it is well known now, uh, this spectrum form factor shows uh, four regimes: uh, a slope, a dip, a ramp, and a plateau. In this case, it is known that the dip and the slope 
are originated in the notion, uh, what is known as spectral rigidity in the matrix model. And um, this uh, spectral rigidity are just uh, due to the universal correlations between eigenvalues uh, uh, that appear in random matrices. So in fact, in this scenario, uh, we can prove very explicitly that the ramp uh, and, the, and the spectral, uh, I mean, that they are related to each other because basically the ramp and spectral rigidity are just Fourier transform of each other. But in the complexity case, before uh, we would want to say that the slope, the complexity slope is, uh, is related to spectral rigidity, but it's, well, analytically computing that is out of reach. And, and what we uh, came, uh, I mean, what, how uh, we attack this problem. Uh, so let me, let me ask the question, like how do we know that the complexity slope arises from spectral uh, rigidity? And one strong hint is to consider uh, these other ensembles in which we put by hand the same density of states but we strip universal correlation. Uh, with this ensemble, the spectral form factor shows no ramp. Is this, uh, again, this light blue? This light blue is just the, the bigness semicircle law without, uh, I mean, but not, not drawn from, from an instance of a random matrix. It's just taking uh, numbers at random from the bigness semicircle law. And, um, and uh, in the complexity, we see also that uh, the slope is missed. When we, when we take that ensemble. So we are going to see a further strong argument in a moment. Uh, before that, uh, for completeness, uh, let me just say that these four regimes ap appear also in the alternative definitions of complexity uh, given by the exponential of the entropy. And, uh, and, and in these cases, although it is, not so, it is not so here, we have verified that the slope disappears uh, when we erase the universal correlations. So, um, I know that I'm running out of time. I just need like five minutes, so hope not, nobody um, complains too much. Um, so to better uh, understand the, the physics of, of, of this complexity slope, um, we, we are going to follow more, I mean, instead of just follow, following the complexity, which is at the end some kind of functional of the probabilities, we are going to follow uh, the probability distribution of the, the microscopic probability distribution of the thermophile double uh, in time, so by taking basically different snapshots uh, at different times, and um, let me remind again that the spectral form factor would be just the what uh, would be just this n equal to zero uh, here at, in the left of, of each of the plots, uh, uh, and well, if you would see it, uh, you you would see that uh, it is it is really the spectral form factor. But what is interesting here is that we see that the wave function of the thermophile double behaves as a coherent subwave, so. Um, it leaves a, a relatively a small tail of probability as it moves, but it is quite uh, coherent. And in particular, it, the, the front of the, of, the, of the wave function overshoots the plateau and bounces back at the end of the Hilbert space. Uh, and this is the origin of the, of the slope. And uh, just to end uh, with the talk, so let me give another, a further argument of why the, this complexity slope is related to spectral rigidity. So um, it is well known in the literature of random matrices, maybe not well, so well known in our community, uh, that the spectral form factor actually differentiates between the three universality classes. So uh, the Gaussian unitary, the Gaussian orthogonal, and the Gaussian symplectic. Uh, this, is, this is explained in this book that I was mentioning uh, before, this book here. Uh, and actually is where I extracted uh, this plot here, which is a plot of uh, some quantities related to the spectral form factor. Uh, let me, uh, well, notice that from this plot that the, uh, the Gaussian unitary ensemble shows a sharp transition from the ramp to the plateau. The Gaussian orthogonal ensemble shows a smooth transition, uh, is this one here. And the Gaussian symplectic ensemble displays uh, this uh, kink, it, it kind of, goes far and then comes back. So we can, uh, using the same methods, we can compute the complexity for the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble and the Gaussian symplectic ensemble. And, uh, and we see clearly that the Gaussian, th that the complexity slope uh, demonstrates uh, the difference between universality classes. Um, and we can safely, so basically this, uh, the, the left one is the, is, the, is the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, which is a very smooth transition to the plateau. And the right one is the Gaussian symplectic ensemble in which the, basically the wave function like uh, overshoots the, the plateau, bounce back, but then uh, overshoots again because it's, it, it's very coherent and then, uh, and then, um, and then plateaus. 
So uh, we can safely conclude that um, that this uh, complexity slope is controlled by, by the same spectral rigidity controlling the ramp uh, and conjecturally expected to be universal for, for chaotic systems. Well, and uh, I'm not going to describe this. Uh, let me just say that uh, we have done all these processes for SYK, and, uh, and, uh, which is a more realistic model uh, because uh, of few body interactions. And uh, we, but we get basically the same results. So, um, we, and we can distinguish between universality classes, and uh, so everything follows the same. So, um, and with this, uh, let me let me finish the talk with uh, with uh, some summary and discussion. So, we have provided a let me call it a Kolmogorov-inspired uh, quantum complexity measure that is non-ambiguous. So, by minimizing overall possible choices. Um, it is the nice thing is that uh, it is computable, and it is actually a function. Uh, although at the beginning might seem uh, might seem very involved, it is actually a functional of uh, the survival amplitude, which uh, makes it very easy to connect with uh, with real uh, with real uh, physical process. Uh, in particular, in the context of uh, the thermofield double, it recontextualizes the spectral form factor as uh, just a, a tiny part of a, of a, com of a complex uh, dynamical process uh, related to the uh, time evolution uh, of this thermofield level with, with a single Hamiltonian. Um, let me repeat that this is a starting point for a, for a bridge between the characterization of, of phases via partition functions to a novel characterization via complexity dynamics. Uh, and um, there, are, there are open questions, I mean, to, to develop that, that bridge, but also to, to understand Einstein complexity, Einstein complexity from this perspective, and also to develop the connections to the geometry of the, of the black hole interior. And excuse uh, apologies for uh, going a little bit ahead of time. Uh, so. Okay, let's thank Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, do we have any questions, Javier? Yeah, Javier, can, can you show the SYK results again? Yeah. Oh, no. I, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't know what's happening. Ah, no, I know what it is. So, um, okay. Well, I put it here like this. Okay. So, um, yeah. So yeah. Then, then let me maybe just say the differences uh, from the other and the and the similarities. So one difference is, of course. The fact that uh, for SYK the convergence to the let's say to the to the mean or to the it it we would need to go to higher dimensional Hilbert space Hilbert spaces so, so to higher n where ah sorry here there is a mistake here this is uh, oh uh, forget about this um, so the, I mean here it should be the dimension of the Hilbert space which is two to the capital n divided by two and um, well, yeah, uh, we should go to higher number of Majorana fermions to see this uh, really the same kind of uh, convergence. Uh, that's one difference. And another difference is that uh, is that uh, depending depending on 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 capital N, um, the model displays. Uh, this is known. Uh, the model displays uh, Gaussian unitary statistics, Gaussian orthogonal statistics, or Gaussian symplectic statistics. So. Uh, basically, for uh, this is the eightfold, the SYK eightfold way, and uh, basically for n mod eight uh, different things, uh, you will get uh, different different results. Here we have just plot, uh, and this was important because, uh, of course, uh, to to get, for example, these nice plots for complexity, uh, you really need to take uh, particular values of n, so that you uh, get the um, the right scalings. Uh, I mean, the so that you get the the Gaussian unitary ensemble. If you take a the others you will get the um, so yeah uh, yeah th those are the only comments that I uh, yeah and now please ask me whatever yeah so on, on the previous yeah on this slide what determines the so as you increase beta 
the transition to the plateau gets further, what determines how far it gets? It seems like it gets further every time. No, no, but it's it's uh, yeah, yeah. But this is just an uh, uh, this is just um, an artifact of the fact that we are considering SYK and we cannot go to very very high uh, very high uh, number of fermions. You should you should that you should see it better here in the in the in the matrix ensembles uh, and. Um, well, you say that. Uh, well, is it clear that my question is: Is it clear that it's still independent of n? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I guess I would have thought because of the locality of the interaction structure, you could get n dependence. Mm -hmm. I think I, I see why in in the pure random matrix case, you don't you, you get a, a transition at order one. Mm. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't analyze that that thing. Yeah, uh, I uh, now that you ask, uh, it is uh, it is probably the case. I mean, yeah. Um, and and what what n is this? Like what what how many fermions? Uh, this is like uh yeah, it's it's a small. Uh, it's like uh. Uh, I think uh, 20, uh, 22, 26, something like that. Ah, okay. It's, yeah, I think that- Then you can probably just check, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you do it for like 22, 24, 26. Oh, no, you can't do 24, so 26 and- Yeah, the and problem is that we can, we can, yeah, the problem is exactly, there are two problems here. The problem is that we cannot go very far in, in capital N uh, because, uh, yeah. Yeah, because it explodes and also, yeah, uh, well, that's one problem, but you have to mix that problem with the fact that you cannot take every n. Yeah, yeah exactly. It because you be have to end. jump, you have to jump for for n each time. Okay. So that's, yeah, so, scaling is worse because of the, the global symmetries. Yeah. Exactly because of the global symmetry. If not, the the scalings. I mean, the the, the I mean, you, you cannot. If you plot that, uh, you you see that uh, everything is messed up because the scalings are completely different. Yeah. And so you have to jump. Uh, but yeah, you start with some men, then the next one is four times bigger, then the next one is four times bigger. And basically, uh, starting from what is interesting, which maybe is, uh, I don't know, 20 or something like that, uh, and what is possible, which is for us is, I mean, we are not uh, using any kind of, uh, we are using uh, table computers. Uh, you can, yeah, basically you can go on until, until 30 or 32, or I don't know. Yeah. So basically you can, you can check uh, three, three possible capital N. In a yeah. single plot, um, here, actually, here actually there are there are only two possible n. Maybe if you yeah if, if uh, you so that's why that's why we didn't we didn't do it. But um, but it's an it's an interesting important question. Yes, but presumably you could even even with just two data points you could extract like if, if you had some onsets for the n dependence you could extract what you know some some evidence for it. Yeah, maybe it's log n, for example, right? Then yeah. you could just check check two values and tune beta such that you probe whether that's consistent or not with where the transition occurs. Mm -hmm. We will we will do that. Thanks for the for the for the comment. Yeah. yeah. I had a question. Um, so you you have computed this this notion of complexity for ordinary matrix model, um, and I was wondering whether uh, you thought or maybe you done something about it in the sense that uh, whether you can also compute it for double scaled models, uh, which are in some sense relevant if you are interested in understanding gravity. Uh, we have we have not done it. We have not done it, but uh, uh, but. Um... I mean, the once it, it is very simple. Now that we have the yeah, it's it's a it's a program. Now that we have it, uh, it's it's a straightforward to input any 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 Hamiltonian as long as you give me a Hamiltonian uh, and a two matrix model still has a Hamiltonian. No, I imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, so you just uh, you just take instances of that Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the difference, there are certain technical things that are different. For instance, this N label 
is no longer uh, discrete in the double scale model. It becomes a continuous variable. Uh, you, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I was, I was, uh, um, I was mistaking your question with uh, models with two matrices. Uh, you are taking. Oh. You are talking, sorry, sorry, sorry. You are talking about uh, these uh, double scale limits. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, well, I mean, in principle, uh, the double scale limit. Yeah, it depends. I, I I don't know. I don't know. It depends on the on the on the explicit regimes that you can access. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I should. Uh, yeah, that's something that's something to do. Um, what I'm saying is that in principle, the double scale limit can be is nothing. I mean, it's just a limit. Uh, it, uh, you still have a Hamiltonian with certain measure, and you are just. I mean, we, you start. You just. You, you can. You have a random matrix uh, theory, which is. Uh, as good as uh, the ones that we are studying, which produce random Hamiltonians, and you just look to that uh, to that uh, theory in certain uh, certain uh, limit of parameters. No, so whether you can access that limit of parameters numerically, uh, uh, probably. I mean, uh, you will be able to study. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't see I don't see a, a, a conceptual abstraction. Uh, is what I'm saying. It yeah. just. Yeah. It's just a technical, probably a technical issue. If if, uh, if if there is, I don't know. Yes, I I, I agree. Um, uh, I think so, some of the methods would be different uh, for the reasons. Uh, for instance, this this n label will no longer be a discrete thing. It will be a continuous. Uh, this uh, yeah, I mean, some of the technical things I think change. Um, but yeah, but my question, I, I think you've answered it. Is whether you thought about it or what you would expect. Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, for future. No, no, we haven't, we, we haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't gone to to other types of matrix models. Yeah, that that would be the, the natural uh, next step. Mm -hmm. To to once, for example, uh, like the the completion of the of the yeah some some completion of the um, Schwarzian theory, um, the ones this uh, square root. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. It is natural to to consider to consider those in that limit that you that. Uh, we have not done it. And uh, I have another question. Do you have any comments about the, what you expect, or if you expect a holographic description of this complexity compared to the others? Uh, I mean, what, what I, what, yeah, I don't, I don't, well, this is, yeah, this is a, a question we, we are leaving for the, for the future. What I'm just saying is that um, uh, the elements that uh, come into, into, into this, um, I mean, that at the end of the day, what we are computing is really the wave function of the thermophile level under time evolution. So uh, I guess that uh, it should be possible to compute from there the, um, any kind of observable. Um, Um, let me say it in another way, maybe. What I'm saying is that uh, uh, even if we call it complexity, what is important here is that uh, we are we are really studying the let's say the dynamical evolution of the thermophile double and uh, all its little probabilities, and those are all related to this uh, um, analytically continued partition function. So, in principle. Uh, and, and by the moments, and everything has a kind of a gravitational avatar. Um, so yes, um, I mean, I don't have a precise answer. This is something we put it in, in the discussion in the article, right? uh, but uh, yeah, we feel that um, it should be simple to, to, to derive. In, in particular, for example, this, uh, these recent articles uh, studying the, the black hole interior volume in more detail and uh, so uh, they also, at the end, they also uh, connect with the uh, with aspects of random matrices. So, yeah, it's it's just a question of uh, of uh, a little bit further development. But... Okay, thank you. You mentioned some proofs in the beginning of optimality of of the mm -hmm. log basis. Do those arguments also work for operator complexity? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. This theorem says so. Yeah, so uh, so um, I haven't. So in the article, yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I mean, for maybe the people who know, I mean, I have worked uh, hard in in operator instead of operator complexity, have missed some kind of uh, 
connections with, with that work. And in the, in the article, we have a full section about that. But uh, I mean, there were many, many things to discuss today. And I was I prefer not to not to do the known thing. So in the in the article is is very explained. But uh, let me say that uh, uh, so this is this you can you can you can uh, you can think about this uh, as a generalization of key of complexity. So basically, uh, so if you start with an operator, uh, you um, uh, you need to choose an inner product, and then uh, once you choose an inner product, you convert the operator algebra into a Hilbert space, and in that moment, you also uh, what you also do is um, well, is uh, put the problem in the form that we are writing it here. So you have an initial state, and the Hamiltonian is, is just the Liouvillian. Okay. So in other words, every kilo of operator complexity can be uh, written uh, as a as this quantum state complexity uh, after after the choice of the product uh, after the choice of the inner product. Okay. Uh, but uh, the the reverse direction is not the case because actually, as you well know, as you uh, are well aware, uh, for kilo of operator complexity, uh, you always have uh, you only have the ends. You don't have the a ends, basically because uh, the second, well, the action of the Liouvillian in the operator gives you another another uh, state of the kilo basis. Okay, but this is not general. Uh, when you go to 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 the Hilbert, I mean, to the to this quantum state complexity, this is not a general as it can be. So the most general thing is uh, is this uh, this uh, scenario in which you take a generic Hamiltonian in a Hilbert space and you evolve a generic initial state, and then you are going to have these two sets of Lanzos coefficients, the ANs and the BNs, generically. So in, in a two D CFT, because of the state operator correspondence, do you still have the ANs? Uh, yeah, 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 certainly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, I mean, notice that the ANs are just uh, maybe I, I read it here. They are just uh, they are going to be there whenever you have uh, whenever you have uh, non-zero expectation values of the Hamiltonian in the initial state. Basically, uh, this a zero here uh, in this formula uh, in the in the kilo of operator complexity, you will have the kilo of states, and H would be the Liouvillian, and this is just zero by construction. But this is not the case in in for generic states. Notice, uh, let me say in another way. Notice that you don't only can construct the states in the in a CFT uh, by acting with a primary at the position zero. I mean. Uh, Okay, so the, the ones which have ANs are like states with real physical time dependence. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, uh, let's thank Javier one more time. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope it wasn't very technical. <laughs>